How do thinking models work? There's been tons of advancements in the research and development of large language models, but the type of LLMs getting a lot of attention these days are thinking models, also sometimes called reasoning models. These models use more tokens when generating an answer and can achieve better results in complex tasks like coding, advanced mathematics, and data analysis. In addition to the model response, when you use one of the Gemini thinking models, you'll see a short summary of the contents of the thinking trace, which is intended to help you follow the model's reasoning path. And while this thought summary can offer insights into the model's internal reasoning process, it still doesn't explain our primary question. How do thinking and reasoning models actually work? To answer this question, let's start with the concept of scaling laws. Scaling laws describe how model performance improves as you increase the amount of training data and compute. Basically, more compute plus more data plus more parameters equals better models. So far in the world of transformers, we've seen this relationship hold true. We've made models bigger and bigger and trained them on more and more data, and they've become increasingly better at generating fluent and nuanced text, solving tough problems, and writing executable code. So increasing compute on the training side has improved model quality, but training models is only half of the story. We don't just train models, we also use them to generate responses when a user interacts with the model, often referred to as inference or test time. So researchers started to wonder, can we make models better by giving them more compute power when generating a response? And this became known as test time compute. To figure out how to make use of this test time compute, we can take inspiration from something you might have heard about, chain of thought prompting. Chain of thought prompting is a way to improve an LLM's ability to provide correct responses to complex reasoning tasks. In chain of thought prompting, you prompt the model to generate a series of intermediate steps, aka the chain of thought, that leads to the final answer. With this prompting strategy, models are more likely to produce a correct answer. Here's an example from the original paper. In the no chain of thought scenario, the model is given a few shot prompt with a math question and the corresponding output. In the chain of thought scenario, the model is given the same math problem, but this time we modify the corresponding output to the math problem so that it contains the chain of thought steps highlighted in blue used to calculate the answer. So instead of just the answer is 11, the model is provided with a series of intermediate calculations. Now, if we append to this few shot prompt a new math problem, you'll see that on the left side, the model follows the pattern in the few shot prompt and only outputs an answer. And it gets the math wrong. The cafeteria does not have 27 apples. But on the right side, when the model is prompted to generate the intermediate reasoning steps, highlighted in green, it correctly solves the math problem. The cafeteria has nine apples. In other words, when prompted to show its work, the model gets the answer right. Feel free to pause the video and double check the math, or you can just take my word for it. Now, it might seem strange that encouraging a model to explain itself can result in more accurate answers. But if we think about it in context of how LLMs generate tokens, we can get some intuition into why chain of thought prompting works. LLMs produce responses by generating probable tokens. They take in a sequence of text and return tokens one at a time. Each token is generated from a forward pass through the model. To produce this token here, the model has to solve the whole math problem and figure out that the answer is 9 in just a single forward pass through the model's weights. Alternatively, when the model is prompted to break the problem down into smaller steps, it's generating more tokens, which means more forward passes through the model's weights. By allowing models to reason, they spend more compute before generating an answer. Test time compute is like cranking the dial on this concept of chain of thought prompting. Basically, what if a model could develop tons of different chains of thought and examine all of those to find the best response? Now, there are a lot of different ways you might make use of extra compute at test time. We're still in the early days of model thinking, and the optimal methodology for state-of-the-art models will probably continue to evolve. But here are some of the core ideas that came out of research papers. Starting with the simplest way to use more compute at test time, best of n. Let's take that prompt from before about the cafeteria and apples. We send that prompt to the LLM, and the LLM generates a single response. 
Now, imagine that instead of generating one response, we make multiple calls to the model with the same prompt and generate n responses. We can use temperature to create a diversity of responses. And for simplicity, we'll say n equals 100. So now we have 100 different responses from the same model. Out of those 100 responses, the one we'll return to the user is the response that shows up the most. Generating 100 responses for a single prompt is definitely going to require more tokens and therefore more compute than generating just one response. Hence, test time compute. The big question is, is it worth all that extra compute? And the answer is sometimes. Optimizing for frequency can improve model performance, but you might see a plateau in improvements for nuanced tasks where errors just get repeated across the steps of reasoning in multiple responses. It's like if I was trying out a new baking recipe, but I had mislabeled the salt and sugar in my kitchen. It doesn't matter how many times I attempt the recipe, I'm still going to end up with 100 subpar cakes. So instead of just choosing the most frequent answer from the pool of 100 responses, a more sophisticated strategy would be to use a second model that acts as a verifier or reward model and assigns a score to each candidate. The higher the score, the better the answer. Learned reward models are a type of model used to evaluate and improve the performance of other AI models, often against specific criteria like correctness, fluency, or relevance. To see this in action, let's return to the math problem from the chain of thought paper. A well-calibrated reward model would return a high score for the answer is 9 and a low score for the answer is 27. You might have the reward model provide a score for each of the 100 candidate answers and then return the answer with the highest score. Alternatively, after scoring each of the answers, you could group answers that are the same into buckets and return an answer from the bucket with the highest cumulative score. And yet another variation is to use a reward model that returns a sequence of scores, one for each step of the chain of thought. Okay, so far, all of these strategies involve creating multiple different responses from a single model at test time. But generating a bunch of candidate answers and then finding creative ways to rank and sort them still doesn't explain how we end up with models that produce these really, really long chains of thought to arrive at a final answer. That is where reinforcement learning comes in. We can actually teach models to be better at producing long chains of thought during model post-training. As a reminder, during model pre-training, we generally train LLMs to do next token prediction on massive amounts of text. This initial training phase equips the model with a broad understanding of patterns, features, and relationships within the data. During model post-training, we further improve quality and adapt the model to more specialized tasks, like making them respond as helpful assistants or being better at using tools. When it comes to post-training models, to be good at thinking, you might use supervised fine-tuning to train the model on input-output pairs, where the input is a complicated math or coding problem, and the output is a chain of thought that leads to the correct answer. But using reinforcement learning is what really unlocked improvements in LLM thinking and reasoning capabilities. If you're unfamiliar with reinforcement learning, here's the high-level summary. The way we frame problems in reinforcement learning is as an agent learning to solve a task by interacting with an environment. This agent performs actions on the environment, and as a result, it changes the state of the environment and receives a reward that helps it learn the rules of that environment. For example, you might have heard about AlphaGo, which was a model trained with reinforcement learning. It learned the rules for the board game Go by trying things and receiving rewards or penalties based on its actions. This loop of taking actions and receiving rewards repeats for many steps, and that's how the agent learns. So what does this have to do with large language models? Well, in the case of reinforcement learning for LLMs, the agent is the LLM that we want to tune. And note that this is a different use of the word agent than when people talk about agentic AI. The current state is whatever is in the context window, so something like the prompt and any generated text until this point, and actions are generating tokens. If we're trying to get the model to be better at thinking and reasoning, we can have the model attempt problems with objective answers, like complex math or logic questions. The reward in this case is what's called a verifiable reward, meaning it just checks if the model got the correct answer. 
This gives the model clear, unambiguous feedback so that it can update its course of action. Note that this framework does differ from supervised learning. The model isn't shown any predefined examples that map from input to output like a math problem and the corresponding solution. Instead, the LLM learns by interacting with the environment, exploring a space of possible actions, receiving rewards for those actions, and then adjusting its parameters to maximize future rewards. By prioritizing the paths that lead to correct answers, the model learns, without extra-labeled data, how to effectively make use of tokens for reasoning. A surprising behavior that emerges during this type of training is that the length of reasoning chains become longer over the course of reinforcement learning, and these longer chains tend to correspond with improvements in performance. Now, in practice, it's useful to use a combination of supervised fine-tuning and reinforcement learning to improve the model's thinking abilities. In the paper, SFT memorizes, RL generalizes, well, the title kind of gives away the punchline, but researchers found that supervised fine-tuning can be used to bootstrap the reinforcement learning process. Essentially, supervised fine-tuning teaches the model to follow instructions and produce answers in a consistent and predictable format. And then, reinforcement learning can be used to help the model generalize its reasoning capabilities, learning rules and knowledge that can be applied to new, unseen variations of a task. So, putting all of this together to answer our original question of how do thinking models work, we saw that with chain of thought prompting, letting a model generate a series of intermediate steps before producing an answer can lead to improved performance. And previous scaling laws would suggest that allowing models to think longer— aka giving them more compute at test time, should improve an LLM's ability to provide correct responses to complex tasks. And there are two main ways we can get models to use more compute when generating a response. During post-training, we can use reinforcement learning to make models think and reason more effectively by producing long chains of thought. By training on problems that have verifiable answers like math or code, the models practice reasoning and improve their skills. After the model is trained, you can deploy strategies like best of n at test time, where a model produces multiple responses to the same question, increasing the chance of a correct answer. Combining these strategies, we end up with thinking LLMs, which generate long reasoning traces to arrive at an answer to a user query. As with everything in AI, the state of the art is constantly changing. Every thinking model is likely designed a little differently, but the core ideas and concepts are the same. It's all about getting the model to more effectively utilize compute at test time. To try out Gemini's thinking capabilities, check out the tutorials in the description box. And if you want to go deep on some research papers that cover different thinking, reasoning, and test time compute methods, there are a bunch linked below. Thanks for watching and let me know in the comments section what other research topics you'd like to learn about. As always, I'll read the research papers so you don't have to. 